Hi, my name is Callie Chappelle, and welcome to this video about various experiments and the scanning model. This video is made for MTDB 427, which is molecular biology at the University of Michigan. So we're talking about eukaryotes, and in eukaryotes, we have in the nucleus transcription that occurs, then post-transcriptional processing to produce a, a, a mature mRNA. That mature mRNA gets exported into the cytoplasm where translation occurs. So what happens is ribosomes come onto the mRNA, and starting at the initiating AUG, uh, start translation. And translation continues, as shown here. But the key question we want to know is how does the ribosome actually find that initiating AUG? How, how does it know that AUG is the place to start translation? And these experiments done by Marilyn Kozak, here's the citation, uh, are really, really interesting about explaining how that happens. So first they notice a couple of things. The first thing that they notice is that, init that initiation of translation always starts with the first AUG. It rarely ever starts with kind of internal, quote unquote, internal AUGs. And they also notice that uh, when, when translation begins, that AUG that, that is used is not some fixed distance from the end of the mRNA. So they're like, when they're trying to figure out, well, well what is the mechanism for how the ribosome actually finds this AUG, it, it seems to be something that's not like some kind of measuring, some kind of measuring device where, okay, we start some fixed distance from the end, from the 5' prime cap. No, it seems to be something else, maybe something to do with the sequence surrounding that AUG. And so they propose this model, the scanning model. And the way the scanning model works is they propose the 40S subunit hops on at the 5' cap, doesn't really hop on it. It comes to the 5' cap, and in conjunction with factors, with met tRNA initiating with thionine, and also in GDP, it scans down. So it slides down from the end, from the cap, to this initiating AUG. And the key question we want to ask here is how does the ribosome actually find this AUG? How does it know to stop there? Or not really the ribosome in its entirety, but this 40S subunit. So the question they really want to ask is, is the area around this initial AUG important and or necessary for initiation of translation at this part? So the key question here for this first experiment, the what I'm going to call the consensus experiment, is, is there an optimal sequence around or near this initiating AUG that dictates which AUG actually gets chosen? So the next thing I want to do is jump into the method. But before I do that, I want to set it up for you, kind of what is the structure of what, what we're really talking about. So they do, the researchers um, create these, uh, Kozak et al., creates this construct that has an SV40 promoter. Here's where the, uh, here's where the plus one is um, for 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 transcription. And then we have we have kind of a little a little extra space here and then we have our pre-proinsulin gene. Remember the beginning of that gene is going to start with an ATG. Now we're talking about DNA here. So this is DNA. And so you know normally the start codon is AUG, it's going to be ATG in the non-template strand of the DNA, okay? And what we want to know, remember, is the area around the initial AUG important and or necessary? So what they're going to do is they're going to take nucleotides are surrounding this ATG in the DNA, and they're going to mutate various ones. And they're going to ask the question, okay, well, once this gets transcribed, okay, so here transcription's occurring, and we've got, we've got our mRNA transcript here, and we have translation, how does mutations around this AUG affect the ribosome stopping here? At this, at this initiating AUG. And so if we are making mutations that make the ribosome more inclined to start translation there, we're going to get lots, lots of translation. And the level of translation will be directly proportional to kind of how good this region is for getting initiation to start at this spot. So, so we're using the pre-proinsulin gene. So after we have um, transcription occurs and we've got our mRNA and then we have translation, it's going to produce this thing called the pre-proinsulin. But um, what happens is preproinsulin actually gets cleaved into a product called proinsulin, which we're then going to immuno immunoprecipitate or IP out. And so let me go through this with you, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. So first, what we're going to do is, as I explained, we're going to mutate nucleotides around the clone rat preproinsulin gene ATG. And then once we have, so we're going to create this construct, and then we're going to introduce into cost cells, so these are from monkey kidneys. And what that does is it allows transcription and translation to happen. So remember, ultimately what we're going to assay is the protein that's being produced, specifically the pro-insulin protein that's being produced um, from this pre-pro-insulin gene that's being controlled by this ATG that has various mutants around it. But in order for us to assay the protein, protein actually needs to be made, right? So we need to have transcription and translation actually happening, which is why we put it in these cost cells.
Um, and and then we're going to label newly synthesized protein with 35 S methionine. So we're going to have 35 S met just floating around. And so when methionine gets incorporated into this protein, it'll be radio labeled because it'll be a 35 S. It'll be a radio labeled methionine that's integrated. But remember, we're 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 uh, making the protein in cost cells. So so this is not the only protein that's being synthesized. There's bunches of other proteins which I've drawn here. Would also get labeled. In fact, all the proteins that are being produced at this time by these cost cells will be radio labeled because there's 35 S methionine around. So we have a problem. So we have our protein of interest that's radio labeled, and that's ultimately what we're going to want to assay. But we also have a bunch of other radio labeled proteins. So the way that we actually separate out our protein of interest that's radio labeled from other radio labeled proteins is by doing amino precipitation. All right. And, and just a reminder how amino precipitation works is so we have an antibody that's specific to an epitope on our protein attached to a B. Uh, we mix it together so the so the antibody will attach to our protein and then we'll separate out our proteins and we'll centrifuge so when we have our centrifuge um, our protein of interest will go to the pellet because we've got this huge bead that'll bring it down and then we'll have just our protein of interest and and so we're going to IP our pro insulin and we're actually going to do it twice in two rounds and ultimately the second round doesn't really matter because almost all of our protein comes out in the first round but you should know that when we're reading the results they're going to be two rounds after we have our protein of interest isolated we're going to run a protein gel ectophoresis and then we'll visualize our radio labeled protein using an auto radiogram so now that we understand what's going on let's take a look at what the data is and let me first walk you through how this is set up. So up here, we've got various mutants that are labeled. There's B38, which is kind of the, the initial mutant they made, and then a bunch of other mutants. So these are going to be subsequent uh, changes from the B38 mutant, and we'll see how those mutations, remember those mutations that are around that initiating ATG, how those mutations affect the level of translation. All right, here, this row tells us the IP. So remember, they do two different amino precipitation. They do a first one where pretty much all of our protein comes out, and then they do a second one. And so really, the one that we're going to focus on is just these one columns, because two, um, as you can see, there's not really much there in any of these. So we don't, we're not going to worry about two too much. All right, so remember, this is a protein gel, and we're visualizing radio-labeled proteins. So this is what we're seeing. Uh, uh, the stuff up here that you're seeing is just other proteins that uh, are radio-labeled that come out from our IP. So perhaps our epitope is not specific to just our pro-insulin, just our pro-insulin protein. Maybe perhaps it, it, it picks up other things or just other proteins seem to pellet out. Um, and also, and finally, what we're seeing here, these bands, oh, these show pro-insulin. So these are this is where pro-insulin is migrating on this gel. And so we can look at these bands down here and, and be able to compare the level of translation between these various mutants. The last thing I want to point out is what's going on down here at the very bottom where they give you the relative OD and then the actual mutant. So the relative OD just tells us the optical density of the protein that's here. It, that's here. it seems to be here in each of these in each of these bands. So this just tells us that they've quantified the concentration of protein in each of these bands. And finally, this is showing us actually the sequence of the mutant. So remember, up here, up here we have our, oh, I'm trying to scroll up and it's not wanting to scroll. We have our DNA here. And remember we have this mutated, we have this mutated region. Those are denoted by the red axis. This is showing that mutated region as well as the ATG. So if I take this and I flip it around, I flip it around this way. This is what we're seeing. Where the ATG is here. And that ATG is this. And then these one, two, three, four, five nucleotides represent here, these five. All right, and then that one below the ATG represents this T down here at the plus four position. Now, one thing that I want to point out that's somewhat confusing is the way they've numbered these. So normally we talk about the plus one as the start of transcription, right? But here they're actually, the way they've numbered these, the plus one position is the start of translation, right? So this first ATG. So we're calling this the plus one now, this the plus two, this the plus three, this the plus four. As we go this way, we're translation starting here. So this is the translation plus one. The transcription plus one is somewhere up here. And then anything that's uh, anything that's upstream from this plus one is negative. So negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five is let me just label out here, negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five respectively, and then remember plus one, plus two, plus three, this goes to the ATG, and then this guy is the plus four.
All right, so they're mutating these. And the way that you read this is anytime there's a dot, it's exactly the same. All subsequent mutants are the same at, the, at that position as what's shown here in mutant 38, which is this column. If I scrolled up, you'd be able to see that a little bit better. All right, so here's mutant, here's mutant 38. Okay, so these are all the same, but of course when it's different, they actually they note that. For example, in mutant 39, at the negative 3 position, it's changed from a T to a G. So now that we understand how to read this, let's actually start to interpret these data. So here at mutant B38, what do we see? So here is where we'd normally expect to see pro-insulin, but in this mutant, no pro-insulin is being produced, or we, we can see on this gel. So what does that tell us? Well, it means that if no pro-insulin is being produced, then that means that that translation of the pro-insulin gene, of the pro-insulin gene, or of the mRNA, really, the this pro-insulin mRNA or the pre-pro-insulin mRNA is not is not occurring, right? So we're not getting production of this pre-pro-insulin. So the reason is because for some reason the ribosome is not stopping at this AUG in order to translate this pro-insulin gene or to translate the the pro-insulin open reading frame from the mRNA. And so what does that actually what does that mean? Well, it means well. Let's, well, first, let's take a look at what the mutant was, right? So we've got we've got this mutant, and then we've got our ATG. So what this tells us is the ATG alone, having the ATG without a specific sequence around it, is not good enough to cause translation. This is really interesting. This means that we this this corroborates the fact that we need to have sequences around the ATG in order to, for the ribosome to know that this is the correct ATG. All right, this is what we suspected. Remember, we suspected that the reason why the ribosome, quote unquote, knows to stop at that ATG, or, or really the AUG, because the ribosome's on the mRNA. Um, let me just clarify that, that when I say ATG, I'm talking about the DNA or the gene. That's what we mutate. The AUG is in the mRNA. That is what gets, that is what gets translated. This is what gets translated. This is what gets mutated. I just want that to be really clear. That just having an AUG in the mRNA is not sufficient for the ribosome to be able to stop there. Now let's compare this mutant, B38, to B39. And remember that B39 through B31 are derivatives from this, from this B38 mutant, where we have changes that are shown here in, in, in either the minus 3 or the plus 4 position. So here at B39, it's exactly the same as B38, but instead of having a T at the negative 3 position, we have a G. And so what does that, what does that change result in? Well, suddenly we actually have translation of, the pro, of, of pro-insulin, right? We have pro-insulin being produced. And so what that indicates is having a G at the negative 3 position is better. It's better at telling the ribosome, hey, stop this, a stop this AUG in the mRNA, okay? And start translation here. All right, and the reason why we can compare this is because the negative three position is the only thing that's changing. If and and here at the plus four position we have both T's. Now imagine that at the plus four position we had a G here. You would not be able to compare negative. You would not be able to compare 39 and 38 because there are multiple things that are changing. So you wouldn't be able to attribute this increase in translation to the fact that you have a G now here at the minus three because you're also changing and creating a G here at the plus four. So it only works because you have only one thing changing. Now let's try to compare 38 to 35. Well, 35, it seems like we have even more translation that's occurring, and that's corroborated by our relative OD that are shown here. And so what's happened is now we've kept the plus 4 at the same position again, at the same, at the same uh, nucleotide, but now we've switched from a G to an A, or from really T to a G to an A. And so this tells us that an A at the minus 3 position is even better than having a G, all right? And so now, hey, let's try to compare 34 and 38. But wait, we can't try to compare, well, actually, you can't compare 34 to 38 because even though we have, uh, we have different at the, at the plus 4 position, right now we're going from a T to a G, we both have T's here at the minus 3 position. So we can't compare 38 to 34. So what happens if we switch from having a T to a G at the plus 4 position? Well, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing translation here of, of pro-insulin. And so we see an increase in translation from, from nothing or an OD of less than 0 0.2 to an OD of 0 0.9. And so that indicates that G at the plus 4 position is better than having a T. Let's see what happens about 32. So now we cannot compare 32 to 38, right? Because 
the, the negative 3 position is changing from a T to a C, and the plus 4 position is changing from a T to a G. But we can compare 34 and 32 because G is both the same. So what happens at the minus 3 position if we switch from having a T to a C? Well, we see about we see about the same. In fact, we see the exact same amount of translation occurring. That means it doesn't matter if it's a T or a C at this minus 3 position, regardless of having a T or a C with G at the plus 4, you get the same amount of translation. Now, what happens if we switch over here to a G? We have a G now at the minus 3 position. We have quite a bit more translation. We're going from an OD of 0.9 to 3.1. That indicates that G at the minus 3 position is better than having a T or a C. And in fact, this actually corroborates what we're seeing over here, that we saw the G at the minus 3 position was better than, C, uh, than a T. And here, it's, this shows us that G, if we compare mutants 39 to 38, G is better at the minus 3 position than a T. Now, you can compare these in both cases to between one, one another because the plus 4 is changing, but you would not be able to say that 30, by comparing 38 and 33, that G is better than T at the minus 3 position because this is also changing. You can only compare within groups. Let's do the last one. Here you see when you switch the minus 3 position to an A, even more translation between mutants 33 and 31. This also corroborates the fact that A seems to be better than G at the minus 3 position. So the conclusion here is that A is better than G at the minus 3 position. And let's see, what's better, T or G at the plus 4 position? Well, we see when we compare ones where the minus 3 position is not changing, if we switch from a T to a G at the plus 4 position, and we have a T at the minus 3, we see it increase. When we have, here's when we have a t at the plus 4, and here's one where we have a g at the plus 4. So it seems, this seems to show us that g is better than t. Let's just double check this with a couple more. Here, where we have a t, 0.7. Here, we have a g, 3.1. That's showing g is better. Here, we have, when we have a t, we have a 2.6. Here, when we have a g, we have 5.0. This seems to show us in every case that g is better than t at the plus 4 position, and that a is better than g at the minus 3 position. We can also say that this is better than uh, t at the minus 3 position as well. That is how you read this shell, so I hope that you this was clear to you. Um, the big takeaways here are that we can figure out that um, A is better than G in this case, but both work, and here G seems to be better than T, and that ATG alone is not sufficient. Now, what they did was many, many, many more experiments like this, because they wanted to figure out, well, what is the optimal sequence around this ATG? What is the optimal sequence around the AUG of the mRNA in order to have maximal translation? And so after doing many more experiments, because clearly this is, this is not sufficient in order to come to to the conclusion I'm about to show you, they did consensus sequence. So this is the sequence that is the best area around the, the ATG, the best area around the AUG and the mRNA for the ribosome to come on the mRNA, or really come on the mRNA and stop here to cause the production or to cause the translation of free proinsulin and thus proinsulin. So this is a pretty cool experiment that was done by Marilyn Kozak, and definitely check out the second video, the second part, part two of the barrier experiment video to take a look at what they did next to confirm this, something called a barrier experiment.